I'm adjusting my uh, my internal camera in here just briefly because I do want to roll on some of this for later use on YouTube this morning because I don't have a, a note yet of a potential conflict. We are expecting a Congressman Raul Labrador at 8.15 this morning and uh, looking forward to that. I, I We didn't get a chance to speak to him last, uh, last month because of a some issues with scheduling conflicts and the like. Now, often these people get called to the floor, and, and what will happen is at the last minute we have to make a change. But he's been anxious to talk with us about a couple of issues that are of importance to his office. And just, I think, yesterday, last night, before I went to bed, I was reading that his caucus in the House of Representatives uh, is on board with the new plan put together by, uh, oh, gosh, by uh, Rand Paul from the U.S. Senate and then over on the uh, House side, uh, by a congressman from South Carolina, uh, who used to be the governor of that state, so we we could see if these people get their way, they will be repealing Obamacare much more quickly than some Republicans have actually. Well, they're they're making a lot of some some Republicans, not the uh, the Freedom Caucus that Congressman Labrador belongs to. Some Republicans though are making excuses right now, but it does appear that the the the, the repeal and replace bill that has been put together by Mark Sanford and by, by Rand Paul, could well do this all in one trick. So there you go. Uh, that's what we'll be talking about in a few minutes, too, as well, if we have the opportunity. Uh, our main focus, though, is talking about a third federal judge for the state of Idaho, because this state, by the way that federal judges are allocated, is way overdue for a new federal judge just because of the population growth we've had. A couple of other quick things, though, before we actually talk to, uh, to uh, Congressman Labrador. I have this that I got to mention right off the top of the program. I am a I'm a regular reader of Boise Weekly. Boise Weekly is is an alternative newspaper from the state capitol. I admit sometimes that I do read things that are not necessarily we hear it all the time people are criticized for self-selecting. If you're a conservative, you only want to read and watch conservative news outlets or listen to talk radio. And if you're a liberal that you know you, you only want to hear your news from MSDNC and the New York Times and the Maybe the Idaho Statesman, although I think that's unfair. A lot of the reporters there, I think, uh, happen to be, and any newspaper in the state of Idaho, you've got a mix of different personalities. I don't necessarily always agree with the viewpoints I see in Boise Weekly, but I appreciate Boise Weekly does some stories that other people don't do. And I came across this uh, this morning. Uh, SPLC report. Let me try that again. SPLC. My voice is breaking. It must be puberty all over again. SPLC report counts Idaho anti-Muslim groups. Now, that stands for Southern Poverty Law Center, which has been criticized by an English scientist for being a knee-jerk liberalism. But you may recognize some of the names that have been added to this list. The list of anti-Muslim and refugee group names, two chapters of Act for America, one in Meridian and the other in Twin Falls. Treasure Valley Refugee Watch in Meridian, Buell-based committee to end the CSI Refugee Center, and then check this one out. Priest River-based, and this is a real organization, Pig Blood Bullets. <laughs> That's a, there's an old apocryphal story that says that as the United States uh, troops were battling insurgents, Muslim insurgents in the Philippines well over a century ago, that in order to, uh, to quell uh, a disturbance, uh, that bullets were, were soaked in blood. Now, we don't really know if that's historically true. It's just it's called apocryphal because it's been cited a lot. It could be true but we don't necessarily know that it, that it actually took place. So I guess they get their name, Pig Blood Bullets, uh, up in Priest River from that. Here's my point, though. I know a lot of these people, at least in the Act for America chapters and in, uh, in some of these other organizations. I don't know anybody from Priest River. I will, I will confess that. But most of the people who are involved in these organizations are really just good, kind, decent people who are concerned about the safety and security of their communities. Some of them have PhDs. Some of them own shops. Some of them have ranches and farms. You know, they have real jobs. They go to church on Sundays. They pray mightily. And yet they're lumped in here. Now, there may be a handful of people in some of these organizations who aren't very nice. I've criticized Counselor Chris Talkington from here in Twin Falls just last week on the program. However, let me just put, say one thing. Let me praise him on one count, and, and I should have done it a long time ago. He referred to a guy who was spotting off at a meeting, a public be heard session, as being a Klansman. I'm paraphrasing that. Gosh, last summer, 
And then later on, you know, he said he was a kind man. He said, I'm sorry for having said that. But, you know, he may have been right, at least in that one particular case. Yes, there are some people who are quite nasty in some of these organizations. But in any organization, you're going to find if you've got 500 people in a room, they may all be making common cause. Not all of them may be the nicest people. The majority still are nice, but not all of them. I understand that. But I think it's a little heavy-handed to include these groups. These are people who are just concerned about preserving a way of life we have, which is a generally safe way of life. Now, I mentioned this scientist from England. His name is Alex Cairo. Let me tell you a little bit about it. He's writing today uh, at something called Real, Real, I'll get that out, Real Clear Science. He's a graduate student of science and technology policy at Science Policy, uh, Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. That's in England. And he's writing about how liberals have gone off the deep end. And I found this on page two. In a strange twist of fate, the left's arguments have been adopted by the very right-wing groups they oppose. As philosopher of science Mira Nanda has noted, the arguments used by the postmodern left have been used by nationalists in India to reject liberal enlightenment values and justify some nasty cultural practice, practices and authoritarian tendencies. And he goes on to say, and in the United States, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has traditionally done some good work fighting racism and homophobia, has surrendered to the postmodern tendencies of the left by labeling liberal Muslims Majid Nawaz and Ayan Hirsi Ali as extremist bigots. And, and this, uh, this Hirsi Ali, she is a woman who was tortured in her own country, her own Muslim country, and managed to escape, and then came to Holland and then the United States. She's been threatened with death by a lot of these radical Islamist groups because of her opposition to the, to the worst elements of that religious faith or that law system, which is a little, it's both, if you didn't know. But the Southern Poverty Law Center says she's a, she's a hateful person because she's standing up against the mutilation of women, treatment of women by these countries, the enslavement of the infidel. So yes, the liberals have become completely uh, people off the rails. We hope to speak with Congressman Raul Labrador in just a moment on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com. We'll have about 10 minutes with him. And then we're going to be talking about some of these sanctuary city efforts coming up in the next half hour of the program right here with Bill Colley on Top Story. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. And uh, we're expecting a check in from. Representative Raul Labrador, who represents, of course, northern Idaho in the House of Representatives in Washington and is a member of the Freedom Caucus. And uh, they have a lot on their plates over the next few days and coming weeks and months. We'll talk about that in the next hour of the program, too, as well. Uh, There are a lot of people who are even surprised in the Republican Party how slowly things have been moving in Washington in recent weeks. I was reading about that this morning, and there was a congressman... um, Walker is his name. Uh, I think it's Mark Walker, and he was suggesting that what we're dealing with is a surprise, even to Republicans, because, well, they control both houses, and they have a president who at least is a registered Republican and has actually put together a, a pretty conservative approach to his, uh, his way of running a government. So you would think that with the numbers in their favor that we would see a lot more action and a lot more activity going on when it comes to all of this, uh, but that indeed is not the case so far. I was also reading at the Daily Signal this morning, uh, which is a publication of the Heritage Foundation. I was reading a piece from a a writer. He's he's involved in, call it the conservative or even the Tea Party movement in his home state of Tennessee. And he went out to see a a town hall meeting by one of his his representatives and uh, says that he was disappointed. Uh, Her name is, uh, she's, she's Congresswoman Black and she's from Tennessee, but the guy said he was slightly disappointed in the fact that he feels some Republicans aren't moving toward that repeal and replace as quickly as they could when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. I believe uh, we have a guest joining us at 818 this morning, uh, Congressman Raul Labrador from Northern Idaho. And welcome to the program, sir. Good morning. Or perhaps not. Hello? Nope, we don't. <laughs> We've had phone issues sometimes because of weather. Mainly they were related to a lot of the cold we had earlier this winter. And there was a period where we had a lot of rain that we were dealing with, and it seems to have impacted that. But this fellow in Tennessee was mentioning that he was talking to his representative, 
And he came right out and said to her, so, you know, why no repeal and replace? And he said, she started to hem and haw and go off in different directions. But the room was also filled with a lot of these liberals who are now showing up in large numbers. They think they're emulating the Tea Party. And they're, they're shouting down various members of the House or Senate who are holding these meetings. And I, I got the impression, what we're dealing with here, we're dealing with a group of people who, they're still worried what celebrities might say about them, or the local newspaper editor might say about them. Uh, when John Kennedy, well, he didn't actually write it. The book was called Profiles and Courage. It was written likely by Ted Sorensen or one of his other, Arthur Schlesinger or one of his other handlers. But his name went on it, and it was used uh, as a powerful tool as he was getting ready to campaign for the presidency in 1960. I don't know. And the book featured a lot of people who risked their political careers to do things they thought were right. And some of the stories are quite astounding. And, you know, these are some legendary figures in American history, and some of them lost their seats because they did the right thing. And I think what, what becomes a huge area of concern for a, a lot of people today is we don't have folks out there who are willing to put it all on the line. Instead, there's a great big industry about getting people reelected and uh, getting people reelected and then just ensuring that, th that that's a perpetual job for them. It becomes even more important than actually getting anything done. And they're also trying to appease people. I told a friend a couple of weeks ago, we were having a cup of coffee, and I said, how many people do you think actually read the op-ed page around here on a daily basis? And he thought for a moment and said, maybe 200. And most of those people are politicians, right? That's what we're dealing with. And I brought that up for that very reason, because I think that uh, that, that, itself, uh, that that itself is something that we have to keep in mind. And therefore, the constituents, the overwhelming constituents, really aren't paying any attention to that. They're paying attention directly to what the representatives say. Uh, I hope we have a caller. I hope it's uh, Congressman Raul Labrador joining us at 821. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Sorry I was late. I was just <laughs> running from a meeting, and I was delayed. I explained to my listeners, actually, at 806 this morning, that because of the, the duties you have, where you get called and you have to move around a lot, that these things actually happen frequently, and it's just it's part of the, uh, part of the job you have. Uh, I know we were going to do this last month, and we were going to talk a little bit about the proposal you have for a third federal judge in Idaho, because according to population numbers, we're long overdue. What has been the holdup? You know, the, the holdup is that everyone wants a judge in their district or their state. The reality is that we have an actual judicial emergency. You know, we have a judicial emergency occurs whenever any court with more than one authorized judgeship and, uh, and has, has only one active judge. And right now we have Judge Windmill, who is the only remaining full-time judge in our, in our court. Um, it also includes any vacancy in existence for more than 18 months, and you look at the weighted caseload and all these other things. So we have an actual judicial emergency. We have been saying this for years, uh, but every time we go to our committee, the, the committee uh, responds that other uh, states also have judicial emergencies. But I think when we've looked at the caseloads in our state, the caseloads in, in our judicial district, we far out, outpace any, any other district that, that is out there. So we're working pretty hard to get this done, and, and I, I hope that this is the year that we can get it done. I, I was going to say uh, uh, we, we would probably be able to, I would think at least, there's, there's somewhat of an ally now in the White House, and with our own congressional delegation, we would likely find a lot of support for getting this done and getting it done quickly. I think there's support for getting it done. I don't know about getting it done quickly. And, uh, you know, I spoke to some members of the committee uh, yesterday, in fact, and, and, and you still get some pushback because they, they try to explain how other districts have, have this, this issue. But, you know, we, we've had a second judge. Our, our second judge was authorized in 1954. Think about that. Think about the growth of the population in the state of Idaho since 1954, and since 1954, we've only had two judges. So I think we're definitely overdue. Uh, you know, the population growth has produced what we consider a predictable uptick in the federal courts. 
and and I hope we can we can work on this. I think this is the year. I think we have some assistance from the administration, but it's going to be convincing the other members of the House. The good thing is that the entire delegation is committed to this. You know, we have. I know that uh, Congressman Simpson has introduced legislation that is similar. We have con uh, the two senators that are committed to making sure that this happens. So we're going to work pretty hard on making sure this happens this year. I had, I had mentioned to your office the other day, uh, one of your colleagues, Lou Barletta, who comes from uh, north central Pennsylvania, and a friend of mine actually has known him for about 50 years, uh, was explaining to me uh, that uh, he has proposed a bill uh, that would that would go beyond what the president has proposed to defunding sanctuary cities. And we're going to talk about that a little later this morning because a number of states and cities are arguing about this at the moment. Are you in support of that? Well, I don't know his bill, but in general, yes, I am in, in favor of supporting, uh, I mean, of of uh, taking funds away from, from sanctuary cities. And, and the other topic that we didn't get to discuss uh, with your office, but I just happened to look over the Daily Signal last night, and your caucus was mentioned, the Freedom Caucus, as uh, being on board with Mark Sanford and uh, and uh, Senator Paul with the uh, repeal and replace of Obamacare. Uh, do you see any action on that coming quickly? Yes, that's actually we, we're going to we're in the middle of that fight right now. So what we're finding is that that when we were just talking in theory about uh, repealing and replacing Obamacare, it seemed like a lot of Republicans were willing to beat their chest and say how tough they were going to be to repeal and replace Obamacare. Now that we're we're playing with live rounds. Uh, I think some people are getting scared, and that's what happens here in Washington, D.C., that all of a sudden you start seeing a few protests at town halls, and you start seeing some people complaining, and and uh, members of, typical members of Congress just run for the hills because they don't want to be have any opposition. Well, the reality is that repealing and, and, and replacing Obamacare is a difficult task. The Democrats completely messed up the health care system. What they did is they created a system that mo most health insurance companies are leaving now. Yes, you know this week, one major insurance company left the exchange market. A second one is already announcing that they're going to uh, that they're going to leave. Ironically, I was just talking to a reporter as I was walking to my office, and she kept asking me the question, well, what are you guys going to do about this? Isn't it unfair that these health insurance companies are leaving the health care, the, the, the exchange markets. And I'm like, that was not our, our making. That was the Democrats who did this. And and she seemed to have a really hard time understanding why. She said, yeah, but, but that's, you know, we know this was a mess, but what are you guys going to do about it? So, so the media is trying to blame us for the problems that Obama created with the health insurance industry and the, and, and health health care for all Americans. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we unravel the mess that is Obamacare and put something in place that protects our citizens and brings down the cost of health care. But we're having this major fight because a bunch of people here want to just replace it with something that is just like Obamacare. And and um, and I think that's the wrong way to go. I, I had a chuckle. I was watching Neil Cavuto's show the other day, and he said it's an urban myth that Republicans don't have an alternative plan. And uh, and I would say that, that that's part of the media's job is to make sure that we hear about it, but we're not. Well, the, and, and that's the issue. It's, uh, and I, 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 I heard somebody say it's not that we don't have an alternative plan, it's that we have too many plans. And that's that we have about six or seven alternative plans that are being debated and discussed right now. And I think that's that's what we're trying to figure out, which one is the one that is most free market. And, and at this point, the Mark Sanford, uh, Rand Paul plan is the one that I believe is closest to a free market approach. Congressman Labrador, always good to talk to you. I know you've got a busy schedule. We wish you good luck on all of this and look forward to talking again soon. All right. Thank you very much. Take care, sir. 828, Bill Colley with you as well. Our top story this morning. On News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 37 right now. We're going to talk a little law enforcement coming up in a few minutes. There's a lot of stuff going on there that I've just been reading coming out of Boise the last few days. Uh, we'll have some details on the way in just a couple of minutes. I also wanted to very quickly share with you uh, a quick note. Uh, I am going to, I hope by the time I get to my weigh in next week, be down 70 pounds on the total body transformation system. And I've been telling you about this for a long, long time. I had a caller left me a message at my desk uh, this morning, and she wanted to know the telephone number. If she doesn't get it on the show this morning, I'll call her back later. 
You can learn more by calling Don Chandler here in Twin Falls at 208-731-3560. He's lost over 50 pounds himself on this diet. Don is at 731-3560. And I'll tell you, this is something that I've got to stress that works. It works because it actually has a healthy meal replacement. And the cost of that meal replacement is equal to what you'd be getting when you go out and buy groceries. So you're not going to be out of pocket any more additional money. It burns six times more fat and you'll lose eight times more weight than normal results from diet and exercise alone. You also get to have a healthy amount of calories. I mentioned yesterday I can still eat pizza. I just don't necessarily eat the whole pie, uh, that being the key. And uh, we, we do want to point out uh, that the average person on this diet in 60 days, just 60 days, will lose 22 pounds and four inches off his or her waist. It's 8.30. Dan Tom going to be joining us from the Twin Falls County Sheriff's Department in just a moment. It's 36. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com.